Okay, to move right along, second presentation is on carbohydrate restriction induced elevations in LDL cholesterol and atherosclerosis, the keto trial to be presented by Professor Matt Budov and his colleagues at the Harbor UCLA Medical Center locally here in Torrance, California. Matt. Thank, thank you very much. It's certainly a pleasure to be here with everybody. Um, so a very, uh, I think a very interesting trial that I, I was involved in. Uh, see my co-authors here. Uh, um, so I, I have no conflicts of interest with uh, with anything related to this. And uh, the funding was has been provided by a, a citizen science foundation, more of a a crowdfunding organization. So when we talk about using CT angiography to look at atherosclerosis, there's actually quite great data as far as how robust it is and reproducible it is. We can look at stenosis severity and find patients non-invasively who have significant stenosis. We can look at the number of lesions and see how many different plaques are present. We can look at plaque volume, which is going to be more pertinent to what we're talking about tonight. We can look at lumen volume and how much, uh, how big the, the arteries are. And of course, uh, look for things like high risk plaques. And uh, using this, this modality to track atherosclerosis is going to be, uh, it's been coming very robust. And I don't think there's a large pharmaceutical company today that's not doing a trial using serial CT angiography to see if their drug has an effect on atherosclerosis. So we undertook this study to look at um, this interesting population of patients who go on a carbohydrated restricted ketogenic diet um, and end up with a very high LDL cholesterol. And it's not typical. There's many patients with obesity or diabetes who have uh, uh, restrict their carbohydrates. They go on a ketogenic diet and their LDL gets better. Their HDL and triglycerides get better. But there's a subgroup who are very lean, who have an extreme increase in LDL cholesterol. And I'll talk about the, the mechanism or the proposed mechanism in a moment. But these patients are, are uh, so what we, we take these patients who are non uh, they have non-familial uh, hetero uh, hypercholesterolemia. We we had genetic testing to prove that they had a normal LDL at baseline. They went on a ketogenic diet. Their LDL went up to over 200 milligrams per deciliter, and we fought, and we uh, enrolled them in this prospective study. The prospective study is going to look at a one-year plaque change with LDLs above 200 milligrams or above 190 milligrams per deciliter on a ketogenic diet to see if they have more rapid plaque progression. What I'm gonna show you tonight is the baseline characteristics, their first scan after being on a ketogenic diet for 4.7 years, and we're gonna compare it to a population-based study called the Miami Heart Study to look to see if they have increased atherosclerosis compared to matched uh, uh, patients. Now, it should be understood that lean mass hyperresponders are different than FH. While they both have very high LDL cholesterol, lean mass hyperresponders have a normal cholesterol if they have a normal diet. And when they're, they're on a low-carb diet, their LDL goes up dramatically. They are otherwise healthy individuals. These are lean individuals. Um, in general that we studied, and they tend to have this remarkable response of LDLs that go up. I think worldwide, there's somebody with an LDL above 1,000 milligrams per deciliter um, uh, induced by a ketogenic diet. FH, on the other hand, is a congenital dis disorder. They have high LDL through their entire life, uh, and it's unrelated to their diet. So we... Uh, matched 80 of our 100 participants with an LDL above 190 milligrams per deciliter. They had to have high HDL and low triglycerides, matched one-to-one -one for age, gender, race, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, and smoking to asymptomatic subjects from the Miami Heart cohort. We couldn't match all 100 patients in our study because Miami Heart didn't have the same age range as we did, but we matched 80 patients to this Miami Heart cohort across all of these different uh, uh, 
values. We couldn't match them for, for LDL because, of course, these lean mass hyperresponders had remarkably high LDL. These patients had a documented uh, ketogenesis. They had uh, ketones uh, measured, and they had to have, again, normal or no, no genetic predisposition or no genetic markers of uh, familial hyperlipidemia. These are the baseline characteristics, and there were differences, most notably, of course, in LDL cholesterol. To 72 average LDL in the keto group, Miami Heart group had an LDL of 123. All the other variables were well matched um, uh, as best we could match these, these two different populations. So when we looked at these population, they were both 55 years old, uh, again, the uh, lean mass hyperresponders had an LDL of 272 milligrams per deciliter on an average of 4.7 years duration. So it wasn't like this was one week of being having an LDL that, this high. This was a, almost a five-year duration of having a ketogenic diet and an LDL above 190 milligrams per deciliter. And when we compared them to patients with more normal uh, LDLs, LDL, mean LDL of 123, there was no difference in coronary plaque burden. So we did not see any uh, evidence that this LDL of 272 induced more atherosclerosis over this five-year period. We looked at calcium score. We looked at total plaque score on the CT angiogram, and neither of them showed any differences whatsoever. There was no relationship between LDL cholesterol and elevations in uh, uh, presence of plaque. When we look at the calcium scores between the groups, again, 80 patients in each cohort, there was no difference in calcium scores. There's no difference in total stenosis score. In other words, how many stenotic vessels they had. There was no difference in total plaque score and no difference in the number of segments of plaque that were involved uh, with their uh, arteries. So they had exactly the same plaque characteristics as a population of patients who did not have an LDL above 190 milligrams per deciliter. When we look across the different cohorts, you can see LDL um, uh, up and down and the uh, plaque distribution in, in green. There was no difference between these two groups. As a matter of fact, the area under the curve was identical. So there was absolutely no increase in plaque uh, between the lean mass hyperresponders with an LDL cholesterol of 272 milligrams per deciliter and the Miami heart population, which had an LDL cholesterol of 123 milligrams per deciliter, again, matched across all other variables that we could match. When we looked at the uh, total plaque score, how much plaque they had in their coronaries compared to their LDL. This is now stratified across LDL, and we can see total plaque score, no difference across LDLs going up as high as 600 milligrams per deciliter, and no relationship in either the keto group on the left or the Miami heart group on the right. So these two groups had very, very similar um, uh, um, plaque distributions, and there was no significant difference between the two. So what's the proposed mechanism? Well, we know that in lean, metabolically healthy subjects, carbohydrate restriction will lead to uh, a, a glycogen depletion in the liver, and we think that that leads to a lipoprotein lipase-mediated turnover, which increases LDL. And you can see at the very bottom here that more LDL-mediated VLDL turnover leads to a higher uh, um, uh, export of VLDL. When you have more VLDL and lipoprotein lipase, you end up with more HDL and more LDL and less triglycerides. You, you process that VLDL, you convert it into, LD, into uh, LDL, uh, VLDL, you convert it to LDL cholesterol, and you end up with higher levels of both HDL and uh, LDL cholesterol. So we think that it's all lipoprotein lipase mediated. Obviously, this needs more evaluation, but in a lean person, the the body switches its energy model to a more uh, uh, to uh, activate lipoprotein lipase. When we looked at um, a cohort of patients, so you could say, well, this is not really a fair analysis. We're looking at five years of high LDL versus a lifetime of high LDL. 
but I want to show you this population of patients from Denmark. In Denmark, they studied patients with coronary calcium scores. These were 11,800 patients with LDLs above 190, very similar to what I just presented. And you'll see that more than 50% of these patients with a lifetime LDL above 190 did not have any coronary calcium. So not all LDL automatically promotes atherosclerosis. And if they have no coronary calcium, their hazard ratio for having a high LDL was one. There was no increased risk of having a high LDL in the setting of no atherosclerosis. So I don't believe that all atherosclerotic plaque, is, uh, that all LDL is necessarily pathological. So our limitations, we only had 4.7 year follow-up. The sample size was only 100 patients. We're going to study these patients at one year uh, follow-up for CT angio, and then hopefully longer term as well. And of course, we did not have hard CV outcomes. But I'll just conclude by saying that these patients with metabolically healthy co cohort of lean mass hyperresponders did not have greater atherosclerotic burden than participants matched with more normal LDL values. And there was no correlation in this co in study between LDL cholesterol and plaque burden. So with that, I'll stop and thank you all very much. Great presentation. Thank you so much, Matt. So does it blow away the LDL hypothesis? So no, I, I think that I think it's very important to recognize, and let me just go back here because this is the LDL hypothesis. In this population of patients from Denmark with, with FH, if they had coronary calcium and a high LDL, they were 3.5 times more likely to suffer myocardial infarction and 2.4 times more likely to die. So there's still a very strong relationship between LDL and cardiovascular events, but I don't think everybody is susceptible to LDL. And this, again, I think is a unique population where their LDL is up for a different reason than genetically elevated LDL cholesterol. So I don't want to- No, this is fascinating. I'm a believer in LDL. Sure. Yep. Uh, Matt, I may I missed it. Uh, did you do a particle counts? And number two, uh, what, what, was it the dense? Uh, which which fraction went up, the dense particle or the fluffy type? And if you look at the LDL, so the LDL particles are larger. We're still doing a lot of advanced work with Boston Heart and Ernie Schaefer's group. So we're going to have a lot of different variables coming out of this, including particle number, particle size, large. But I believe it's more large, fluffy LDL which may not be as pathological. Okay, Zach, first, and then you go. So Matt, I wonder if, if, this is, if there's some sort of ascertainment bias involved in your finding a unique cohort of individuals who don't have coronary disease and are able to follow a ketogenic diet, et cetera, et cetera. So you've, in a certain sense, selected individuals who will not demonstrate coronary disease. And now you're saying, aha, they don't have coronary disease. Well, it's a great point, Zach. And and I, I want to be very clear. This is not the primary endpoint of the trial. The primary endpoint of the trial, this is just the baseline characteristics. We're going to look at the effect of very high LDL over the course of one year to see if they have progression of atherosclerosis. But I agree with you, Zach. We need to look at this over time to make sure this is not just an ascertainment bias that we're taking healthy people and just saying, oh, they don't have a lot of plaque at baseline. Okay, you go next. Please. So I just have a quick question as far as um, do you have an idea of why this subset of patients get these extremely high LDLs on a ketogenic diet? I mean, this is not normal, right? I mean, people right. don't. don't. It's a small subset of patients. We think that when you're lean and you have, uh, these are patients who are very lean at baseline that their lipoprotein lipase is activated. They have more VLDL excretion from the liver because the liver is glycogen depleted. They excrete more LDL, VLDL, and that VLDL then gets converted more rapidly into LDL. You gonna it's a do small subgroup of patients though. Are you gonna do any kind of genotyping or? To... So we did genotyping. These are patients who have every single, they had to be in the trial, negative for every single known genotype for FH or any hypercholesterolemic process. So we have no no signals from genotyping. Yeah, in, right. the, 
And the people who are normally put on a ketogenic diet, although you said they're lean, usually they experience a significant amount of weight loss. Uh, was there a lot of weight loss in that group? And could it be that over 4.7 years, if you have a whole lot of weight loss, that's cardioprotective. Uh, and there are many mechanisms that could explain maybe why you don't see the sort of change in the arteries when you look at them. Uh, absolutely. So this is the baseline characteristic. So this is our first point 10 times. So we have to look at that, but we will look at weight change over the course of the prospective study. This is the beginning of the prospective study. Dr. Gallagher. Hey, so um, we are seeing these people in clinical practice and it makes us feel very uncomfortable when somebody walks in with this. So would you recommend that we're supposed to just ignore the LDL and not treat them if they walk in? Oh, no. So I would say get a calcium score. If we have great data that a calcium score of zero does not induce long-term risk, then a calcium score of zero in this population should re reassure you that the Denmark study was FH, lifetime LDL, and they had no increased risk of high LDL if their calcium score was zero. Okay. So I would say get an LDL. Uh, no more questions. I'm going as fast as I can. You know, one and two. Okay. I think the ketogenic diet is counterproductive because how much fat do you have in the diet? Supplying ketones themselves would be more productive than ketogenic diet. Ketogenic diet is an Atkins diet, old-fashioned diet. Well, so I think we knew it would be nice to study ketone replacement versus a ketogenic diet. But I think the we just heard about the SGLT2s, and I think one of the proposed mechanisms of SGLT2s is more ketones as an energy source. So I think we need to explore that further. Okay, Yehuda, and that's it. So, Matt, just to understand, did, did I see it correct that the people in the study had a BMI of 22? Yes. Lean mass. These are lean patients. That's very lean patient. Very lean. That's not what we see typically in the clinics, right? Typically, they are obese with BMI of 30 and 35. You know, we're going to have LDL speed things act the same way in that population. Yes. No, and, and this is a lean mass hyper responder. These are lean patients who I think process this diet differently than our type 2 diabetics or obese patients where they have a different response to LDL as well, though. Thank, Thank you. you, Zach.